This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. To find out more, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Becky Cook. Commentaries on the Gallic War by Julius Caesar. Translated by Thomas Rice Holmes. Book 1, Chapters 30 through 41. On the conclusion of the campaign against the Helvetii, envoys from almost every part of Gaul, the leading men of their respective tribes, came to congratulate Caesar. They were aware, they said, that, if he had exacted atonement from the Helvetii by the sword for the wrongs they had done in the past to the Roman people, yet his action was just as much to the advantage of the Gaul as of the Romans. For though the Helvetii were perfectly well off, they had quitted their own abode with the intention of attacking the whole of Gaul, usurping dominion, selecting for occupation out of numerous tracts the one which they deemed the most suitable and the most fertile in the whole country, and making the other tribes their tributaries. The envoys begged to be allowed to convene, with Caesar's express sanction, a pan-Gallic council for a particular day, representing that they had certain favors to ask of him after their substance was unanimously agreed upon. Their request being granted, they fixed a date for the council, and bound themselves mutually by oath not to disclose its proceedings without official sanction. After the council had broken up, the tribal leaders who had been closeted with Caesar before returned, and asked permission to discuss with him privately, in a place secluded from observation, matters which concerned their own and the commonwealth. The request being acceded to, they all prostrated themselves with tears at Caesar's feet. They told him that it was their aim and endeavor to prevent what they said from being disclosed no less than to obtain the favors they desired, because they saw that if they were disclosed, they would incur the most cruel punishment. Their spokesman was the Aeduan de Vicaicus. Gaul, he said, comprised as a whole two rival groups, the Aedui being the overlords of one, and the Arverni of the other. The two tribes had been struggling hard for supremacy for many years, when it happened that the Averni and the Sequani hired Germans to join them. About 15,000 had crossed the Rhine in the first instance, but the rude barbarians conceived a passion for the lands, the civilization, and the wealth of the Gauls, and afterwards more crossed over, the number at that time in Gaul amounting to 20,000. The Aedui and their dependents had accounted them repeatedly, and had been beaten, and had suffered a great disaster, losing all their men of rank, all their counsel, and all their knighthood. Overwhelmed by these disastrous defeats, they, whose prowess and whose hospitable and amicable relations with the Roman people had before made them supreme in Gaul, had been forced to give as hostages to the Sequani, their most illustrious citizens, and to bind the tribe by oath not to attempt to recover the hostages, or to solicit aid from the Roman people, and to remain for ever without demur beneath the sovereign powers of their conquerors. He himself was the only man of the whole Aeduan community who could not be prevailed upon to take the oath or to give his children as hostages. He had therefore fled from his country and gone to Rome to claim assistance from the Senate, because he alone was not bound either by oath or surrender of hostages. A worse fate, however, had befallen the victorious Sequani than the beaten Aedui, for Ariovistus, king of the Germans, had settled in their country and seized one-third of the Sequanian territory, the best land in the whole of Gaul. And now he insisted that the Sequani should quit another third, because a few months previously twenty four thousand Herudes had joined him, and he had to find a place for them to settle in. Within a few years the whole population of Gaul would be expatriated, and the Germans would all cross the Rhine, for there was no comparison between the land of the Gauls and that of the Germans, or between the standard of living of the former and that of the latter. Ariovistus, having defeated the united Gallic forces in one battle, which took place at Mage de Briga, was exercising his authority with arrogance and cruelty, demanding from every man of rank his children as hostages, and inflicting upon them all kinds of cruel punishments if the least intimation of his will were not obeyed. The man was a ferocious, headstrong savage, and it was impossible to endure his dictation any longer. Unless Caesar and the Roman people could help them, the Gauls must all do as the Helvetii had done leave house and home, seek another abode, other settlements out of reach of the Germans, and take their chance of whatever might befall them. If his words were reported to Ariovistus, he had no doubt that he would inflict the heaviest penalty upon all the hostages in his keeping. Caesar, by his prestige and that of his army, or by his late victory, or by the weight of the Roman name, could deter any fresh host of Germans from crossing the Rhine, and protect the whole of Gaul from the outrageous conduct of Ariovistus. 
After Divicaicus had made his speech, all who were present began to weep bitterly and to entreat Caesar for help. He noticed that the Sequani alone did not behave like the rest, but remained mournfully looking down, with heads bowed. In astonishment he asked them what was the reason of this behavior. The Sequani made no reply, but remained without uttering in the same mournful mood. After he had questioned them repeatedly, without being able to get a single word out of them, the Aeduan, Divicaicus, again answered. The lot of the Sequani, he explained, was more pitiable and more grievous than that of the others, because they alone dared, not even in secret, complain or implore help, and though Ariovistus was away, they dreaded his cruelty just as much as if he were there, confronting them, for while the others had at any rate the chance of escape, the Sequani, having admitted Ariovistus within their territories, and all their strongholds being in his power, would have to submit to every form of cruel punishment. On learning these facts, Caesar reassured the Gauls, and promised to give the matter his attention, remarking that he had every hope that Ariovistus, in return for his kindness and indifference to his authority, would cease his outrages. When he had finished speaking, he dismissed the assembly. Besides these considerations, indeed, many circumstances forced upon him the conviction that this problem must be faced and solved. First of all, there was the fact that the Aedui, who had repeatedly been recognized as brethren, indeed kinsmen, by the Senate, were held in subjection under the sway of the Germans, while their hostages, as he knew, were detained by Ariovistus and the Sequani. And this, considering the great power of the Roman people, he regarded as an extreme disgrace to himself and his country. Besides that the Germans should insensibly form the habit of crossing the Rhine and enter Gaul in the large numbers was, he saw, fraught with danger to the Roman people. He believed, too, that being fierce barbarians, they would not stop short when they had taken possession of the whole of Gaul, but would pass on into the province, as the Cimbri and Titoni had done before them, and thence push on into Italy, especially as the Sequani were only separated from our province by the Rhone, and he thought it essential to obviate this danger at the earliest possible moment. Moreover, Ariovistus himself had assumed an inflated and arrogant demeanor, which made him quite insufferable. Accordingly, Caesar decided to send envoys to Ariovistus, requesting him to name some spot midway between the respective quarters for a conference, and saying that he wished to discuss with him political affairs and matters of the utmost importance to both parties. Ariovistus told the envoys in reply that, if he had wanted anything from Caesar, he would have gone to him in person, and if Caesar wanted anything from him, he must come to him. Besides, he could not venture to go without his army into the districts occupied by Caesar, and he could not concentrate his army without collecting a large quantity of stores, which would involve great labor. Moreover, he was at a loss to understand what business Caesar, or for that matter the Roman people, had in his part of Gaul, which he had conquered by the sword. When this reply was conveyed to Caesar, he again sent envoys to Ariovistus with the following message. Ariovistus had been treated with great kindness by himself and by the Roman people, having, in his consulship, received from the Senate the titles of king and friend. Since he showed his gratitude to himself and the Roman people by raising objections when invited to a conference, and refusing to make any statement or to inform himself about matters which concerned them both, these were Caesar's demands. First, he must not bring any additional body of men across the Rhine into Gaul. Secondly, he must restore the hostages belonging to the Aedui, authorize the Sequani to restore theirs. Furthermore, he must not provoke the Aedui by outrages, or attack them, or their allies. If he complied, Caesar and the Roman people would be bound to him by lasting goodwill and amity. If not, then, in accordance with the resolution which the Senate had passed in the consulship of Marcus Messala and Marcus Piso, that the governor of Gaul for the time being should, so far as the public interest would permit, protect the Aedui and the other friends of the Roman people. Caesar would not suffer the wrongs of the Aedui to go unavenged. Ariovistus replied that the rights of war entitled conquerors to dictate their own terms to the conquered. The Roman people acted on the same principle. They regularly dealt with the conquered peoples, not in obedience to the mandate of a third party, but according to their own judgment. If he did not dictate to the Roman people how they should exercise their rights, the Roman people ought not to interfere with him in the exercise of his. The Aedui had become his tributaries, because they tempted the fortune of war, fought, and suffered defeat. Caesar was doing him a serious injury, for his coming depreciated the tribute. He would not restore the Aedui their hostages, but neither would he attack them or their allies wantonly if they abided by their agreement and paid their tribute annually. 
If not, much good would the title of brethren of the Roman people do them. As for Caesar's threat, that he would not suffer the wrongs of the Aedui to go unavenged, no man had ever fought Ariovistus and escaped destruction. Let Caesar come on when he liked. He would then appreciate the medal of the Germans, who had never known defeat, whose lives had been passed in war, and who, for fourteen years, had never sheltered beneath a roof. Simultaneously with the delivery of this message, envoys came to Caesar from the Aedui and the Treveri, the Aedui to complain that the Herudes, who had recently migrated into Gaul, were devastating their territory, and that even the surrender of hostages had failed to purchase the forbearance of Ariovistus while the Treveri announced that one hundred clans of the Subi, commanded by two brothers, Nasua and Simbarius, had established themselves on the banks of the Rhine, intending to attempt a passage. Caesar was seriously alarmed. He considered it necessary to act at once, lest, if a fresh horde of Subi joined Ariovistus's veteran force, it might be harder to cope with him. Accordingly, he arranged as quickly as possible for a supply of grain and advanced against Ariovistus by forced marches. After a march of three days, he received news that Ariovistus was hurrying with all his forces to seize Visantio, the largest town of the Sequanti, and had advanced three days' journey beyond his own frontier. Caesar felt it necessary to make a great effort to forestall him, for the town was well provided with military material of every kind, and its natural strength made it a most valuable military possession. The river Dubes winding round in a course that might have been traced with a compass, and almost surrounding the stronghold the remaining space not more than sixteen hundred feet where the river left a gap was occupied by a hill of great elevation the banks of the river on either side touching the base of the hill the hill itself was converted into a citadel by a wall which surrounded it and connected it with the town caesar pushed on by forced marches day and night took possession of and garrisoned the town while he was halting for a few days close to visantio to collect corn and other supplies a violent panic suddenly seized the whole army, completely paralyzing every one's judgment and nerve. It arose from the inquisitiveness of our men and the chatter of the Gauls and the traitors, who affirmed that the Germans were men of huge stature, incredible valor, and practiced skill in war. Many a time they had themselves come across them, and had not been able even to look them in the face or meet the glare of their piercing eyes. The panic began with the tribunes, the auxiliary officers, and others who had left the capital to follow Caesar in the hope of winning his favor, and had little experience in war. Some of them applied for leave of absence, alleging various urgent requests for their departure, though a good many, anxious to avoid the imputation of cowardice, stayed behind for very shame. They were unable, however, to assume an air of unconcern, and sometimes even to restrain their tears. Shutting themselves up in their tents, they bemoaned their own fate or talked dolefully with their intimates of the peril that threatened the army. All over the camp, men were making their wills. Gradually, even legionnaires, centurions, and cavalry officers, who had long experience of campaigning, were unnerved by these alarmists. Those who did not want to be thought cowards said that it was not the enemy they were afraid of, but the nearer roads and the huge force which separated them from Ariovistus or the difficulty of bringing up grain. Some actually told Caesar that when he gave the order to strike the camp in advance, the men would not obey, and would be too terrified to move. Observing the state of affairs, Caesar called a meeting, to which the centurions of all grades were summoned, and rated them severely for presuming to suppose that it was their business to inquire, or even to consider where they were going, or on what errand. When he was consul, Ariovistus had eagerly solicited the friendship of the Roman people. Why, then, should any one suppose that he would abandon his loyal attitude in this harebrained way? For his own part, he was convinced that when he came to know his demands and realized the fairness of his terms, he would not reject his friendship or that of the Roman people. But supposing he were carried away by mad passion and went to war, what on earth was there to fear? Or why should they distrust their own courage in his generalship? The measure of their enemy had been taken at a time when their fathers could remember, when the Cimbri and Teutoni were, were defeated by Gaius Marius, and the army confessedly earned no less credit than their commander. And again in recent years in Italy during the slave war, although slaves were, in some measure, helped by the experience and discipline which they had learned from us. This war enabled one to appreciate the value of steadfastness, for the men whom the Romans had long dreaded without reason, while they were without arms, they afterwards overcame when they were armed and flushed with victory. Finally, these Germans were the same whom the Helvetii had many times encountered, 
not only in their own, but in German territory, and generally beaten. Yet the Helvetii were no match for our army. Those who were alarmed by the defeat and rout of the Gauls could ascertain, if they inquired, that the Gauls were tired out by the long duration of the war, and that Ariovistus, after keeping himself shut up for many months in an encampment protected by marshes without giving them a chance of attacking him, suddenly fell upon them, when they had dispersed in despair of bringing him to action, and beat them by craft and stratagem rather than by valor. Ariovistus himself could not expect that Roman armies were to be trapped by the craft for which there had been an opening against the simple natives. Those who pretended that their cowardice was only anxiety about supplies and the nearer roads were guilty of presumption, for it was evident that they had either no confidence in their general sense of duty or meant to lecture him. These things were his business. The Suquani, the Luci, and the Lingones were providing grain, and the corn in the fields was already ripe about the road they would shortly judge for themselves. As to the report, they did not intend to obey orders in advance, that did not trouble him at all, for he knew that generals whose armies mutinied were either bunglers whose luck had deserted them, or had been detected in some scandalous crime, and thereby convicted of avarice. The whole tenor of his life proved his integrity, and the war with the Helvetii his good fortune. Accordingly, he intended to do at once what he would otherwise have postponed. On the following night, in the fourth watch, he should strike his camp, so as to find out as soon as possible whether honor and duty or cowardice were the stronger motive with them. If no one else would follow him, he would go on alone with the tenth legion, in which he had full confidence, and it should be his bodyguard. This legion Caesar had always treated with special favor, and, on account of its soldierly spirit, he trusted it in the highest degree. After this speech a marvelous change came over the temper of all ranks and with the utmost ardor and eagerness for action took possession of them. The tenth legion, taking the initiative, conveyed their thanks to Caesar through their tribunes for having expressed such a high opinion of them, and declared themselves perfectly ready to take the field. Following their lead, the other legions deputed their tribunes and chief centurions to make their apologies to Caesar, protesting that they had never hesitated or been afraid, and that they recognized that it was their general's business and not theirs to direct the campaign. Their excuses were accepted. By the aid of Divicaicus, in whom he had more confidence than in any of the other Gauls, Caesar had discovered a route which, though it would involve making a detour of more than fifty miles, would enable him to march through open country. He kept his word, and started in the fourth watch. After a continuous march of seven days, he was informed by his patrols that Ariovistus's forces were twenty-four miles from ours. End of Book One Chapters 30 through 41. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Becky Cook. Commentaries on the Gallic War by Julius Caesar. Translated by Thomas Rice Holmes. Book 1, Chapters 42 through 54. On learning of Caesar's arrival, Ariovistus sent envoys to say that, since he had come nearer, and his own safety would probably not be imperiled, he would not oppose his original request for an interview. Caesar did not spurn his offer, believing that he was now returning to reason, as he offered of his own accord, to do what he had refused before when he was asked, and he entertained a strong hope that when he learned his demands, he would, in consideration of the great favors conferred upon him by himself and the Roman people, abandon his stubborn attitude. The interview was fixed for the fourth day following. Meanwhile, envoys were frequently passing to and fro between the two generals. Ariovistus insisted that Caesar should not bring any infantry to the conference, as he was afraid he might treacherously surround him. They must each come with a mounted escort, otherwise he would not come at all. Caesar, not wishing any obstacle to stand in the way and stop the conference, and fearing to trust his life to Gallic cavalry, decided that his best plan would be to dismount all the Gallic troopers and mount the infantry of the Tenth Legion, in whom he had the greatest confidence, on their horses, so that, in case it were necessary to act, he might have an escort on whose devotion he could absolutely rely. On this, one of the soldiers of the Tenth remarked with a touch of humor, Caesar is better than his word. He promised to make the tenth his bodyguard, and now he's knighting us. There was a great plain, in which was an earthen mound of considerable size, about equidistant from the camps of Ariovistus and of Caesar. To this spot they came, as agreed, to hold the conference. 
Caesar posted the mounted legion, which he had brought with him, four hundred paces from the mound, and Ariovistus's horsemen took up a position at the same distance. Ariovistus stipulated that he and Caesar should confer on horseback, each accompanied by ten men. When they reached the spot, Caesar began by recalling the kindness with which he himself and the Senate had treated Ariovistus. The Senate had conferred upon him the titles of king and friend, and the handsomest presents had been sent to him. Such a mark of favor, he told him, had fallen to the lot of few, and was usually bestowed only as a reward for great services. Ariovistus had no right to approach the Senate, and no title to claim anything, and it was the kindness and generosity of himself and the Senate that he owed these distinctions. Caesar explained further that between the Romans and the Aedui there were long-standing and solid grounds of intimacy. Senatorial resolutions, couched in the most complimentary terms, had repeatedly been passed in their favor, and at all times, even before they had sought our friendship, the Aedui had held the foremost position in the whole of Gaul. As a matter of settled policy, the Roman people desired their allies and friends not only to lose nothing by the connection, but to be gainers in influence, dignity, and consideration. Who then could suffer them to be robbed of what they already possessed when they sought the friendship of the Roman people? Caesar then repeated the demands which he had charged his envoys to present, that Ariovistus should not make war upon the Aedui or upon their allies, that he should restore the hostages, and that, if he were unable to send back any of the Germans to their own country, he should at all events not suffer any more to cross the Rhine. Ariovistus said little in reply to Caesar's demands but spoke at great length about his own merits. He said that he had not crossed the Rhine spontaneously, but in response to the urgent request of the Gauls. He had not left home and kinsmen without great expectations and great inducements. Possessions which he occupied in Gaul had been ceded to him by the Gauls. Their hostages had been given voluntarily, while by the rights of war he made them pay the tribute which conquerors habitually exacted from the conquered. He had not made war upon the Gauls. The Gauls had made war upon him. The tribes of Gaul had all come to attack him, and kept the field against him, and he had beaten the whole host in a single battle and crushed them. If they wanted to try again, he was ready for another fight. If they wanted peace, it was not fair of them to refuse their tribute, which they had hitherto paid of their own free will. The friendship of the Roman people ought to be a distinction and a protection, not a drawback, and it was with that expectation that he had sought it. If through their interference his tribute were stopped and those who had surrendered to him withdrawn from his control, he would be just as ready to discard their friendship as he had been to ask for it. If he continued to bring Germans in large numbers into Gaul, he did so not for aggression, but in self-defense. Proof was that he had not come till he was asked, and that he had not attacked, but only repelled attack. He had come to Gaul before the Romans. Never till now had a Roman army stirred outside the frontier of the province of Gaul. What did Caesar mean by invading his dominions? This part of Gaul was his province, just as the other was ours. If he made a raid into our territory, we should be wrong to give in to him. Similarly, it was unjust of us to obstruct him in his rightful sphere. Caesar said that the Aedui had been given the title of brethren by the Senate, but he was not such an oaf. He was not so ignorant of the world as not to know that in the late war with the Allobroges, the Aedui had not helped the Romans, and that in the struggle which with the Aedui had had with himself and the Sequani, they had not had the benefit of Roman aid. He was bound to suspect that Caesar, under the mask of friendship, was keeping his army in Gaul to ruin him. Unless he took his departure and withdrew his army from the neighborhood, he should treat him not as a friend, but as an enemy. In fact, if he put him to the death, he should be doing an acceptable service to many of the nobles and leading men of Rome. This he knew as a fact, for he had it through their agents from their own lips, and he could purchase the gratitude and friendship of them all by killing him. If, on the other hand, he withdrew and left him in undisturbed possession of Gaul, he would reward him handsomely, and whenever he had occasion to go to war, he would fight all his battles for him, and save him all trouble and risk. Caesar spoke at considerable length, the gist of his speech being that he could not abandon his undertaking, that his own principles, and those of the Roman people, would not allow him to forsake deserving allies, and that he could not admit that Gaul belonged to Ariovistus any more than to the Roman people. The Arverni and the Ruteni had been conquered by Quintus Fabius Maximus, but the Roman people had granted them an amnesty, and had not annexed their country or imposed tribute upon them. If priority of occupation were to be considered, the title of the Roman people to dominion in Gaul was unimpeachable. If they were to abide by the decision of the Senate, Gaul had a right to independence. For the Senate, 
although it had conquered Gaul, had granted it autonomy. While these questions were being argued, Caesar was informed that Ariovistus's horsemen were moving nearer the mound, riding towards our men and throwing stones and other missiles at them. Caesar ceased speaking, went back to his men, and ordered them not to retaliate, for although he saw that the legion of his choice would run no risk in engaging the cavalry, he did not choose, by beating the enemy, to let it be said that he had pledged his word and then surrounded them while a conference was going on. When the news spread to the ranks that Ariovistus, in the course of the conference, had arrogantly denied the right of the Romans to be in Gaul, and that his cavalry had attacked our troops, thereby breaking off the conference, the army was inspired with an intenser enthusiasm and eagerness for battle. Two days later, Ariovistus sent envoys to Caesar, saying that he desired to confer with him on the questions which they had begun to discuss without reaching any conclusion. Let Caesar either name another day for a conference, or, if he were disinclined to do that, send one of his officers to represent him. Caesar saw no reason for further discussion, especially as on the preceding day the Germans could not be prevented from throwing missiles at our men. Well, to send a representative would be very dangerous, and would be placing him at the mercy of savages. The best course appeared to be to send Gaius Valerius Procillus, son of Gaius Valerius Caburus, a young man of the highest character and a true gentleman, whose father had been enfranchised by Gaius Valerius Flaccus. He selected him because he could be, thoroughly trusted, and because he knew Gallic, which Ariovistus, from long practice, now spoke fluently, and also because, in his case, the Germans had no motive for foul play. With him he sent Marcus Metius, who was on friendly terms with Ariovistus. Their instructions were to hear what Ariovistus had to say and report to him. When Ariovistus caught sight of them close by, in his camp, he roared out before the troops, "'What are you coming to me for, to play the spy?' When they attempted to speak, he silenced them and put them in irons. On the same day he advanced and took up a position six miles from Caesar's camp at the foot of a hill. The following day he marched his force past Caesar's camp, and encamped two miles beyond, with the intention of cutting him off from the corn and other supplies which were being brought up from the territories of the, from the Sequani and Adui. On each of the five following days Caesar regularly led his troops in front of his camp, and kept them in line of battle, to give Ariovistus the chance of fighting if he wished. During all this time, Ariovistus kept his army shut up in camp, but skirmished daily with his cavalry. The mode of fighting practiced by the German was as follows. They had six thousand cavalry, with the same number of infantry, swift runners of extraordinary courage, each one of whom had been selected by one of the cavalry out of the whole host for his own protection. The cavalry were accompanied by them in action, and regularly fell back upon their support. In case of a check, they flocked to the rescue. Whenever a trooper was severely wounded and fell from his horse, they rallied round him, and they had acquired such speed by training that if it was necessary to make a forced march or retreat rapidly, they supported themselves by the horse's manes and kept pace with them. Seeing that Ariovistus meant to keep within his camp, and being resolved to reopen communication with his convoys without delay, Caesar selected a suitable position for camp about twelve hundred paces beyond the spot where the Germans were encamped, and advanced to this position in three columns. Keeping the first and second under arms, he ordered the third to construct a camp. The site, as I have said, was about twelve hundred paces from the enemy. Ariovistus sent about sixteen thousand light infantry with all his cavalry to overawe our men and prevent them from completing the entrenchment. Nevertheless, Caesar, adhering to his original resolve, ordered the first two lines to keep the enemy at bay, while the third finished the entrenchment. When the camp was entrenched, he left two legions and a detachment of auxiliaries to hold it, and withdrew the remaining four to the larger camp. Next day Caesar, according to his regular practice, made his troops move out of both camps and, advancing a short distance from the larger one, formed a line of battle and gave the enemy an opening for attack. Seeing that they would not come out even then, he withdrew his army into camp about midday. Then at last Ariovistus sent a detachment to attack the smaller camp. Finding was kept up with spirit on both sides till evening. At sunset, Ariovistus led back his forces, which had inflicted heavy loss upon the Romans and suffered heavily themselves, into camp. On inquiring from prisoners why he would not fight a decisive battle, Caesar found that the reason was this. Among the Germans, it was customary for the matrons to tell by lots and divinations whether it would be advantageous to fight or not, and their decision was that it was not fated that the Germans should gain the victory if they fought before the new moon. 
Next day Caesar left detachments of adequate strength to guard the two camps, posted all his auxiliaries in view of the enemy, in front of the smaller one, with the object of creating a moral effect, as his regular infantry, compared with the enemy, were numerically rather weak, and, forming his army in three lines, advanced right up to the enemy's camp. Then at last the Germans perforce led the troops out of camp, formed them up at equal intervals in tribal groups. Herods, Marcomani, Triboci, Fegiones, Nemete, Seduci, and Subi, and closed their whole line with wagons and carts to do away with all hope of escape. In the wagons they placed their women, who, as they were marching out to battle, stretched out their hands and besought them with tears not to deliver them into bondage to the Romans. Caesar placed each of his generals and his quaestor in command of a legion, so that every man might feel that his courage would be recognized and engaged with the white ring, which he commanded in person, for he observed that troops which faced it were the weakest part of the enemy line. When the signal was given, our men charged the enemy line with such vigor, and the enemy dashed forward so suddenly and so swiftly that there was no time to hurl the javelins at them. The men therefore dropped their javelins and fought hand to hand with swords. The Germans, however, rapidly formed in a phalanx, the usual order, and thus sustained the impact of our swords. Many of our men actually leaped onto the flanks, tore the shields out of the enemy's hand, and stabbed them from above. On the left wing the enemy's line was beaten and put to flight, but on the right their greatest numbers enabled them to press our line very hard. Noticing this, the younger Plubius Crassus, who commanded the cavalry, and was more free to observe and act than the officers who engaged in the actual fighting, sent the third line to the relief of our hard-pressed troops. Thus the battle was restored, and the enemy all turned tail and did not cease their flight until they reached the Rhine, about five miles from the battlefield. A few, trusting their strong limbs, struck out and swam across. A few found boats and saved themselves. Among the latter was Ariovistus, who found a skiff moored by the bank and escaped in it. All the rest were hunted down by our cavalry and slain. Ariovistus had two wives, one a Subin by birth, whom he had brought with him from his own country, the other a Norican, a sister of King Vocio, who had been sent to him by her brother, and whom he had married in Gaul. Both of them perished in the rout. He also had two daughters, one of whom was killed, and the other captured. Gaius Valerius Procillus was being dragged along among the fugitives by his warders, fettered with three chains, when he fell in with Caesar, who was leading the cavalry in pursuit of the enemy. To see this excellent provincial, his own familiar friend, rescued from the enemy's clutches and restored to him, and to feel that fortune had not brought upon him any calamity that could lessen the pleasure of victory upon which he might fairly congratulate himself, these things gave Caesar no less pleasure than the victory itself. Procilla said that, in his own presence, they had cast lots three times to see whether he should be burned alive at once or kept for execution later, and happily the lots had so fallen that he was safe. Marcus Metius also was found and brought back to Caesar. When the result of the battle was made known beyond the Rhine, the Subi, who had reached the banks of the river, turned homewards. The Ubii, who lived in the immediate neighborhood of the Rhine, seeing their alarm, pursued them and killed a large number. Having finished two important campaigns in a single summer, Caesar led his army back to winter in the country of the Sequani a little before the usual time, and placing Labinius in command of the camp, started for Kisilpine Gaul to hold the assizes. End of Book One Commentaries on the Gallic War by Julius Caesar, translated by Thomas Rice Holmes. End of chapters 42 through 54. Book Two, Chapters One through Fifteen of Commentaries on the Gallic War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Commentaries on the Gallic War by Julius Caesar. Translated by Thomas Rice Holmes. Book Two, Chapter One The First Campaign Against the Belgae. While Caesar, as we have mentioned above, was wintering in Cisalpine Gaul, frequent rumors reached him, which were confirmed by dispatches from Labienus, that the Belgae, whose territory, as we have remarked, forms a third part of Gaul, were all conspiring against the Roman people, and exchanging hostages. The motives of the conspiracy, it appeared, were these. First, the Belgae were afraid that, as the whole of Gaul was tranquilized, our army might advance against them. Secondly, they were egged on by sundry Gauls, 
some of whom, just as they had objected to the continuing presence of the Germans in Gaul, were irritated by the Roman army wintering in the country and settling there, while others, from instability and fickleness of temperament, hankered after a change of masters, and also by powerful individuals, especially those who had the means of hiring mercenaries, who, as often happened in Gaul, had been wont to usurp royal authority, and found it less easy to achieve this end under our dominion. Alarmed by these messages and dispatches, Caesar raised two new legions in Cisalpine Gaul, and directed Quintus Pedius, one of his generals, to lead them, at the beginning of the fine weather, into further Gaul. As soon as forage began to be plentiful, he joined the army in person, and charged the Senones and the other Gauls who were contraminius with the Belgae to find out what was going on in their country, and to keep him informed. They all agreed in reporting that levies were being raised, and that an army was concentrating. Caesar now thought it his duty to march against them without hesitation. After arranging for a supply of grain, he broke up his camp, and reached the Belgic frontier in about a fortnight. He arrived unexpectedly, and sooner than anyone had anticipated. The Remi, the nearest of the Belgae to Gaul, sent Icius and Andecumborius, the leading men of the tribe, as envoys, to say that they would place their lives and all that they possessed under the protection and at the disposal of the Roman people, that they had not shared the counsels of the other Belgae, or joined the conspiracy against the Roman people, and that they were prepared to give hostages and to obey orders, to admit the Romans into their strongholds, and to supply them with corn and other necessaries. That all the other Belgae were in arms, and that the Germans who dwelt on the near side of the Rhine had joined them, and that they were all possessed by such frenzy, that the Remi could not deter even the Suessiones, their own kith and kin, who had the same rights and laws as themselves, and jointly owned the authority of one and the same magistrate, from taking their side. On inquiring from the envoys the names of the belligerent tribes, their size, and their military strength, Caesar collected the following information. Most of the Belgae were of German origin, and had crossed the Rhine at a remote period, and settled in Gaul on account of the fertility of the land. They had driven out the Gallic inhabitants, and were the only people who, at the time within the memory of our fathers, when the whole of Gaul was devastated, prevented the Teutoni and the Cimbri from invading their country. Inspired by the memory of that achievement, they arrogated to themselves great authority and assumed the air of a great military power. With regard to their numbers, the Remi professed to have full information, for, being allied to them by blood and intermarriage, they had ascertained the strength of the contingent which each tribe had promised in the general council of the Belgae for the impending war. The Belovaci, who, from their valor, prestige, and numbers, were the most powerful of all, and could muster one hundred thousand armed men, had promised sixty thousand picked troops, and claimed the general direction of the campaign. The Suessiones were their own neighbors, and their territory was very extensive and very fertile. Within the memory of men still living, their king had been Diviciacus, the most powerful prince in the whole of Gaul, who was overlord not only of a large part of the Belgic territory, but also of Britain. The reigning king was Galba, who, on account of his integrity and sound judgment, was unanimously entrusted with the chief command. The Suessiones possessed twelve strongholds, and promised fifty thousand armed men. The same number was promised by the Nervii, who were considered by the Belgae themselves as the fiercest of them all, and who were the most remote. The Atrobates promised fifteen thousand, the Ambiani ten thousand, the Menapii seven thousand, the Caleti ten thousand, the Veliocases and the Viromandui jointly the same number, and the Aduatuki nineteen thousand, the Condrusi, the Eberones, the Cairoisi, and the Paimani, who were known by the common appellation of Germans, promised, so the Remi believed, about forty thousand. Caesar addressed the Remi in encouraging and in gracious terms, and ordered their entire council to meet him, and the children of the leading men to be brought to him as hostages. All these orders they carefully and punctually obeyed. He then earnestly impressed upon the Idoan, Diviciacus, 
that it was most important in the interest of the republic and indeed of the Aeduans and romans alike to break up the enemy's forces so as to avoid the necessity of engaging such a powerful host at once the object could be attained if the Aedui marched into the country of the Belovaci and proceeded to devastate their lands. With this injunction he dismissed the Viciacus. Finding that all the Belgic forces had concentrated and were marching against him, and learning from the reconnoitering parties which he had sent out, and from the Remi, that they were not far off, he pushed on rapidly, crossed the Aisne, which flows through the most distant part of the country of the Remi, and encamped near its banks. This movement protected one side of his camp by the banks of the river, secured his rear, and enabled his supplies to be brought up without danger by the Remi and the other tribes. The river was spanned by a bridge, at the head of which he established a strong post, while on the other side of the river he left six cohorts under one of his generals, Titurius Sabinus. At the same time he ordered a camp to be constructed, with a rampart twelve feet high and a trench eighteen feet wide. Eight miles from the camp there was a town belonging to the Remi called Bibrox. The Belgae attacked it furiously on their march, and the garrison had difficulty in holding out that day. The following method of attacking forts is practiced by Gauls and Belgae alike. Surrounding the whole circuit of the fortifications with a multitude of men, they proceeded to hurl stones from all sides against the wall, and when they have cleared it, they lock their shields over their heads and advance right up to the gates and undermine the wall. In this case, the operation was easily performed, for, with such a huge host hurling stones and other missiles, no man had a chance of keeping his footing on the wall. When night stopped the attack, Icius, a remen of the highest rank and very popular with his countrymen, who was acting as governor of the town, one of the envoys who had come to Caesar to sue for peace, sent him word that, unless a force were sent to his relief, he could hold out no longer. About midnight, Caesar, employing as guides the messengers who had come from Icius, sent his Numidian and Cretan archers and Balearic slingers to Bibrax to relieve the inhabitants. On their arrival, the Remi, inspired by the hope of repelling the attack, became eager to take the offensive, and for the same reason the enemy abandoned the hope of taking the town. Accordingly, after lingering a short time in the neighborhood, ravaging the lands of the Remi, and burning all of the villages and homesteads within reach, they pushed on with all their forces towards Caesar's camp, and encamped barely two miles off. Judging by the smoke and watchfires, their camp extended more than eight miles in width. Caesar determined, in the first instance, to avoid an action, on account of the great numbers of the enemy, and of their extraordinary reputation for valor. Still, he daily tested in cavalry skirmishes the mettle of the enemy and the daring of our troops, and found that the latter were a match for them. The ground in front of his camp was naturally just suited for forming a line of battle. The hill on which the camp stood, rising gradually from the plain, extended, facing the enemy, over the exact space which the line would occupy. On either flank its sides descended abruptly, while in front it gradually merged in the plain by a gentle slope. On either side of the hill, Caesar drew a trench athwart about 800 paces long, and at the end of each trench erected a redoubt, in which he posted artillery to prevent the enemy, when he had formed his line, from taking advantage of their great numerical superiority to attack his men in flank and surround them. Having done this, he left his two newly raised legions in camp, so that they might be available at any point as a reserve, and drew up the remaining six in line of battle in front of the camp. The enemy likewise had marched their forces out of the camp and formed them in line. There was a morass of no great size between our army and that of the enemy. The enemy waited to see whether our men would cross it, while our men, weapons in hand, were ready to attack them in case they crossed first, when their movements would be impeded. Meanwhile, a skirmish of horse was going on between the two lines. Neither side would cross first, and the skirmish resulting in favor of our men, Caesar withdrew his infantry into the camp. Forthwith the enemy moved rapidly from their position to gain the river Aisne, which, as the narrative has shown, was in the rear of our camp. There they discovered a ford, and endeavored to throw a part of their force across, intending, if possible, to storm the redoubt commanded by the general, 
Quintus Titurius, and break down the bridge, or, failing this, to devastate the lands of the Remi, who were very useful to us in the campaign, and to cut off our troops from supplies. Caesar, on receiving information from Titurius, took the whole of his cavalry, his light-armed Numidians, slingers and archers, across the bridge, and pushed on rapidly against them. A fierce combat took place at the spot where they were crossing. Our men attacked the enemy in the river, while their movements were impeded, and killed a great number of them. The rest made a most daring attempt to get across over their dead bodies, but they were beaten back by a shower of missiles, while the leading division, who had crossed already, were surrounded by the cavalry and killed. The enemy realized that they had deceived themselves in expecting to storm the stronghold and cross the river. They saw that the Romans would not advance and fight on an unfavorable position, and their supply of grain was beginning to run short. They therefore called a council of war, and decided that the best course would be for the several contingents to return home, and rally from all parts to the defense of the people, whose country the Roman army invaded first. They would thus fight in their own, and not in foreign territory, and have the benefit of home-grown supplies. Among other reasons, they were led to adopt this resolution by the knowledge that Diviciacus and the Idui were approaching the country of the Belovaci, and the latter could not be induced to remain any longer, and refrain from helping their own people. Having come to this decision, they moved out of camp in the second watch with great uproar and confusion. There was no order, no discipline, everybody trying to get the first place on the road, and being in a hurry to reach home so that their departure resembled a rout. Caesar was promptly informed of what they had done by scouts, fearing an ambuscade, for he did not yet clearly see the reason for their departure. He kept his army, including the cavalry, in camp. At daybreak the report was confirmed by patrols, and Caesar sent on ahead the whole of his cavalry, commanded by two generals, Quintus Pedius and Lucius Aruncuelius Cata, to retard the rear guard, at the same time ordering Titus Labienus to follow in support with three legions. This force attacked the rear guard and pursued them for many miles, killing a large number of the fugitives. For a while the rearmost ranks, when overtaken, made a stand, and gallantly resisted the attack of our infantry. The van, fancying themselves out of reach of danger, and not being restrained by necessity or discipline, broke their ranks when they heard the distant cries and ran for their lives. Thus our men slaughtered them in numbers, without any risk to themselves, as long as daylight lasted. Toward sunset they left off, and returned in obedience to instructions, to camp. On the following day, before the enemy could recover from their panic flight, Caesar led the army into the country of the Suessiones, who were contraminous with the Remi, and pushed on by a forced march to the stronghold of Noviodunum. Hearing that it was undefended, he attempted, immediately after his arrival, to storm it. But the moat was so broad, and the wall so high, that, notwithstanding the small number of the garrison, he was unable to carry the position. After entrenching his camp, he proceeded to form a line of sheds, and to make the necessary preparations for a siege. On the following night, before he could resume operations, the whole host of the fugitive Suessiones thronged into the town. The sheds were speedily brought up, earth was shot into the moat, and towers were erected, and the Gauls, alarmed by the magnitude of the works, which they had never seen or even heard of before, and also by the swift energy of the Romans, sent envoys to Caesar proposing to surrender. The Remi interceded for their lives, and their prayer was granted. Caesar took the leading men of the tribe, as well as two of King Galba's own sons, as hostages, and after all the arms in the town had been delivered up, he accepted the surrender of the Suessiones, and marched into the country of the Belovaci, who threw themselves with all their belongings into the stronghold of Bratus Pantium. When Caesar and his army were about five miles off, the older men all came out, stretched out their hands to him, and declared that they were ready to place themselves under his protection and in his power, and that they were not in arms against the Roman people. In like manner, when he had approached the stronghold and was encamping on its outskirts, the women and children stretched out their hands from the wall in the native fashion and begged the Romans for peace. Iviciacus, 
who, after the retreat of the Belgae, had disbanded the Idoan forces and returned to Caesar, interceded for the suppliants. The Belovaci, he said, had at all times been dependents on the Idui and in amicable relations with them, but at the instigation of their leaders, who said that the Idui had been enslaved by Caesar and had to put up with ill usage and insults of every kind, they had abandoned their connection with them and taken up arms against the Roman people. The ringleaders, realizing the magnitude of the disaster which they had brought upon their country, had escaped to Britain. Not only the Belovaci, but also the Idui on their behalf, would beg Caesar to treat them with the forbearance and humanity for which he was distinguished. By doing so, he would increase the authority of the Idui among the Belgae generally, for the Idui commonly relied on their assistance and resources to carry on any wars in which they happened to be engaged. Caesar said he would spare their lives and take them under his protection out of respect for Diviciacus and the Idui. But, as the tribe ranked high among the Belgae and had a very large population, he required six hundred hostages. After they had delivered over and all the arms brought out of the town and piled, Caesar marched from Bratus Pontium to the territory of the Ambiani, who surrendered unreservedly without delay. Their territory was contraminous with that of the Nervii. Caesar made inquiries about the character, manners, and customs of this people, and collected the following information. Traders were not allowed to enter their country. They would not permit the importation of anything in the shape of wine or other luxuries, believing that courage was enfeebled by these indulgences, and manly vigor enervated. They were a fierce, brave people, and railing at the other Belgae and accusing them of having surrendered to the Romans and made shipwreck of their ancestral valor, they vowed that they would not send envoys or accept peace on any terms. End of Book 2, Chapters 1-15